<laughs> Welcome, folks. Uh, sorry for the delay. We had technical issues with our whole system for Zoom as well as YouTube. Uh, this is Joint Justice Oversight Committee. It is October 16th. Um, <laughs> crazy past few weeks for me. Um, we have got a full agenda today, and we're going to do our best to get through the earn time uh, this morning for folks to basic. First, you have to understand what earn time is, and then you have to understand what our <clears throat> role is in looking at extending earn time to folks who are on parole, particularly if they receive earn time, number one. But number two, is there um, opportunities for them to earn the earn time if they're involved in a work program or an educational program? This all started during the session in my committee with some of our House colleagues introducing a piece of legislation that was modeled after Colorado put in a law that for folks who are incarcerated and have been convicted of a misdemeanor, if they engage in educational um, curriculum, that they would receive time off their sentence. The conversations with DOC uh, last fall, uh, DOC looked at this. We do not incarcerate very many people who are convicted of misdemeanors. 95, 98% of our folks who are in our correctional facilities are serving as uh, felony charges if they, you know, for their convictions. So we do offer earn time right now for folks who are incarcerated. And we offer earn time for folks who are out on furlough, <clears throat> but not out on parole. Furlough is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Corrections. When a person is on furlough, the, whether the person goes on furlough or not is decided by the parole board, not the Department of Corrections. It's the parole board that will make a decision if the person violates a condition of parole. It is the parole board that will decide if the person is reincarcerated or stays on parole. So that's an important differentiation. When my committee looked at this this past year in terms of trying to offer some incentives for either a work program or an educational program or even uh, an apprenticeship to work in the trades, if you just did it with folks who are on parole, how would you structure that? If you just did it with folks who are on parole and not furlough, and folks who are incarcerated, is there unfair treatment <clears throat> of folks who are under the custody of corrections? So if you open that up for parolees with a work or educational requirement, do you now have to do that for folks who are on furlough? Do you now have to do that for folks who are incarcerated? So that's a real broad review of what we need to grapple with this committee that we'll need to make a recommendation on how we move forward with providing earn time for folks on parole and whether or not we expand um, qualifications for that. So we're gonna spend this morning dealing with this. First up, I think Ben will coming up. Ben will be coming up and giving us a broad review of earn time as it is now, and then transition into what the legislation is that we need to look at and I can recommend. You coming up front if you want. Everybody. <clears throat> Welcome, Ben. Thank you. What's everybody doing on this fine hot token morning? <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Driving through the rain and the wind. Oh, yeah. Uh, so for the record, Ben Novogratsky from the Office of Legislative Council. Um, so just to quickly kind of piggyback on um, Chair Emmons' uh, opening remarks. <clears throat> so the, the goal for this committee is to make a recommendation by next meeting. Um, and through reviewing DOC's current program on earned time, whether it should be included to include parolees, as well as permitting earned time for educational credits for both offenders and parolees. So two expansions. One of the current programs, just as the parolees and 
whether or not there should be an additional um, aspect of the program to where parolees and offenders can earn time for pursuing educational endeavors or vocational endeavors as well. Um, this review must include an examination of the operation and effectiveness of DOC's um, uh, victim notification system and whether it has the capabilities to handle these expansions. Um, and that's why you're going to hear from multiple witnesses, um, DOC, Center for Crime Victim Services, um, DSAS, um, and, and others. Um, and again, November 15th is the deadline for this recommendation um, to make to the Senate Committee on Judiciary and the House Corrections Committee as well. So that's the goal. Um, so what is earn time? Well, this is governed by 28 BSA Section 8, 818 and DOC's Rule 371.18. Um, basically, it allows an eligible offender to earn a reduction of seven days from the offender's sentence for each month the offender is not adjudicated of a major disciplinary violation and is not reincarcerated from the community <clears throat> in violation of release of conditions. Um, and there is a caveat to that, provided that an offender who loses a residence for a reason other than the fault of their own um, is not going to be deemed reincarcerated. So they're taken out of that equation. Um, and I had prepared a summary and copies of the statutes and rules for last time. Hopefully you will have them. And you, were they any leftovers here um, today? Um, I printed the statute. I can print the, the other. The if anybody needs them. them. Yeah, um, and I believe they're available on, yeah. online too. Um, so that's the general concept. If you meet those qualifications, you can get seven days a month um, off your sentence, essentially. Um, so what's a major disciplinary rule violation? Because that's one of the things. Um, so there are two categories um, of major uh, disciplinary rules. There's major A, major B. Major A violations include violent acts or serious threats to institutional security or personal safety. Major B are serious instances of misconduct to a lesser extent. So essentially anything else that's considered major. Um, any questions on that? <clears throat> Not yet. Not yet. And I, I would say, you know, to preview, you know, DOC might be able to speak a bit more about really what type of conduct goes into those violations. But as far as major A, I mean, violent acts are serious threats to institutional security. So that's pretty clear. That can be assault. Um, that can be uh, to both um, staff and to other um, incarcerated individuals. Um, it may even constitute drug trafficking as well, <laughs> institutional security, but that's probably a context specific um, issue on whether or not it rises to a major A level. So maybe it's major B as well. So just to get you thinking about sort of what these violations are that would take people out of the earn time equation. Um, and again, that there's DOC Administrative Directive 41001 that talks about those different violations. Um, and I believe that's also available online. So you have it in front of you. So Earn time eligibility, let's get into that a little bit. So the eligible offenders right now include sentence offenders and furloughed offenders. And as Chairman said, furlough is something that can be handled by the parole board. Um, it can also be a sentence that's handed down by, by the court. Um, ineligible offenders right now are those on probation, those on parole, um, offenders sentenced to serve an interrupted sentence. So that's one that's not served continuously. Um, it can be served at intervals or work crew. Um, offenders are sentenced to life without parole are ineligible. Um, and then there are also offenders who serve, uh, who are serving for a disqualifying offense, which would include murder, voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping, lewd and lascivious conduct with a child, unless the offender um, with a child under 18, um, unless the person who is the offender is under 18 and the child is over 12. 
and the conduct is consensual. So that's a little caveat there. But basically, lewd and lascivious conduct with a child. Um, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and aggravated sexual assault with, with a child. Those are all excluded from eligibility. Any questions on that portion? Um, so, uh, well, maybe this is a, a question for um, one of the representatives here. I'm just wondering why it's uh, those, those seem to be subsections of the big 12, now big 14 or whatever, um, but not all of them. Right. And um, so in, in other areas, you know, we disqualified people if they've been part of that, uh, you know, all of those. So I'm just curious as to why these are, sub, you know, a subsection of the. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think your your instinct is, is right. That's with a policy. Yeah, choice. That, it was a so. policy decision that was made. So yeah. I'll, I'll wait till there's further discussion about that. I can, when we first put this in place, first this was all done, when we were home in COVID, I think. Uh, when we first put earn time in place, it was for everyone that would be on furlough, regardless of their conviction, and folks who were incarcerated. So when it became implemented, um, it was rolled out, but not everyone was notified that there was this change that was happening. And the victim community really was really on edge on this. Um, because they, it's like being re-victimized again because they went through the whole court and sentencing, agreed to a sentence length of time, and they were not notified when earn time became implemented again, and that impacts the end date of someone's sentence. So when we reconvened in January of 21. Um, Senator Sears did a lot of work on this with Senate Judiciary, as well as my committee in working with the victims community and working with DOC trying to figure out how do we address their concerns. So this disqualifying offenses came from that. Um, so we pulled back a little bit from the original earn time law that we had passed the year before um, to say that those folks convicted of those uh, offenses could not qualify for earn time. And it was working with the victim community as well as DOC, as well with our courts, state press, everyone at the table. So I do have a question, and that is what um, involvement is there? It sounds like it's purely administrative through DOC. Is there any judicial process involved with earn time at all, either pre-sentencing, during sentencing, or during the earn time process? That's a good question. I'd have to double check, but I think it's purely administrative. Yeah. Right. So then you can understand the victim concerns a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly during the sentencing <clears throat> time, because there is a victim's advocate that's working with the victim. Yeah. And if there's a plea agreement that is uh, made, the victim and the victim advocate really worked with that plea agreement. Yeah. And if we used to have what was called good time, right. we had that for many years. We tinkered with it in a variety of ways. And then people, the feel, I think it was back in the early 2000s. Uh, folks were saying we need more truth in sentencing. And if you have good time, you're not getting truth in sentencing when they're being sentenced by the courts because the good time impacts when their end date is. So we repealed earn time. And in so doing that, you do take away a mechanism for DOC to work with folks who are incarcerated or even on furlough as providing an incentive for them knowing that if they're getting certain days, number of days off a month, it helps them possibly focus in terms of, wow, if I play by the rules, 
I can get some time off my sentence. And the behavior within the facility um, furlough may be um, more desirable. So it's an incentive sometimes. And also it was recommended by the Council of State Governments in our Justice Reinvestment to <clears throat> bring back good time, which is now called earn time, as providing a mechanism for DOC to manage their population, but also help the person who's incarcerated know there's an end to their time being served. So that's why I was put in place. So uh, I, I remember us actually coming back and reconsidering uh, after um, discussions with the community representing people who have been directly impacted by crimes. Um, and uh, so is what you're saying, Alice, is that this, is, this list is essentially was uh, what ended up being agreed to by the parties. Okay, thank you. Else? In continuing on, so there is a, an exception for residential treatment when it comes to the calculation of earn time. So if you're not actually in a facility, but um, you are an offender is in a post adjudication residential setting, so they've been sentenced and part of their rehabilitation is a residential setting for substance abuse treatment. Um, they can earn a reduction of one day off their sentence for each day the offender receives inpatient treatment. Um, so that's the only earn time that an offender can earn in that circumstance. So it's a slight difference. Um, notifications and record keeping. So DOC is mandated to notify victims of record about the existence of the program and the option to receive notifications for, from DOC for any ch uh, changes in the offender's scheduled release. So they at least have to present the option to the victim and say, do you want to get notifications about this? Because maybe for whatever reason, some don't. Um, there's trauma associated with, with this and maybe they just want to leave sleeping dogs lies. <laughs> um, they also have to provide timely notice, not less frequently than 90 days to offenders who receive a reduction in their term. So that's to the offender. So within 90 days of getting that reduction, DOC has to notify the offender that you're, you're, you're reducing some time off your sentence. And then finally, a, a system needs to be maintained that documents and records all of these reductions um, in each offender's permanent record. Um, my understanding is that the notification is done through the DOC's um, I forget what the acronym is. I think it's BINS. Um, the victim but, notification system. Yeah. Um, Line. Yeah. Um, but there was testimony last session. <laughs> that there have been, I think, to put it nicely, hiccups with the system. Um, and so that prompted why this um, committee's job is to examine whether or not, you know, there's the merit kind of decision about whether to expand these programs and then the practical side of it is, well, if we do this, can the current system, given its limitations, handle this expansion? Um, so that's <clears throat> to consider as well. Um, but that's really an overview of earn time in its current state right now. Um, I also printed out an excerpt from, I believe it was H836 last year, that was introduced. Um, section four of that bill had um, the expansion to educational credits uh, written out. Um, so when we talk about that, it's kind of um, nicknamed learned time. So play off of earned time. Um, so if you have that in front of you, I can kind of go through it. So this is an example of what it could look like. So oh, Ben, can I interrupt you right there? We've got three, three folks from the committee that are zooming in. Do you have access to this document or do you wanna have it posted on the screen that Ben is talking about? What it is is the excerpt <clears throat> of the bill that my committee worked on last year with the, trying to figure out how to- It's on our website. So it's on our website. I don't know if it'd be easier for you folks to, if we put it up on the screen here. 
put it up on the screen? Is that what I'm seeing? I read nodding. I see. I see nodding. nodding. Let me uh, log on then. Oh, let them do that. Bear with me a minute. So this is sort of what you're going to see, what Ben has put together. This is sort of where the committee kind of worked through a little bit of it uh, during the session, this past session, but we couldn't get anywhere with it. We felt like we we're spinning our wheels because it is very complicated once you start looking into it. <clears throat> On the surface, it looks very simple, but then we got to figure out how to implement it. And what will qualify? And how do you track that? Yeah, we're getting there. And for background, this is was partially based off of Colorado's uh, bill. I, I can't recall if it passed or not, okay. it did. Um, but uh, it's not exactly, but it was used as a template for, for this. Um, so outside of cosmetic changes in the statute, um, you'll see that this also did expand um, earn time to uh, parolees. But if you scroll down to subsection C, which I believe is on the third page, so this is the educational credit. So this essentially allows um, offenders uh, on parole and uh, the qualifying offenders to earn a reduction in term for completing an apprenticeship, a trade certification program, or a higher education degree or other credential awarded by an accredited institution of higher education. Um, and then the reduction of term would be the same seven days for each month that they meet um, of the eligibility requirements. Um, those eligibility requirements are attending all classes or appointments required by the offender's course of study, completes all coursework required by the offender's course of study, and is not reincarcerated <laughs> in violation of uh, release conditions. Um, and again, exempting losing the residence for no fault of their own. Um, again, in addition to those requirements, offenders would earn a reduction for obtaining or matriculating from their programs. Um, so it would be six months for obtaining trade certification or other credential um, that required at least uh, 30 hours or credit hours to be completed to receive that award or credential. Um, one year for obtaining an associate or baccalaureate degree, 18 months for a bachelor's degree, and two years for a doctoral degree. Um, the department would be responsible for designating the programs and apprenticeships um, for the courses of study that qualify for the program. And then again, all notice and record keeping requirements under the current program would be mandated in this expansion as well. Um, and you'll see here just more um, kind of cosmetic changes. So what we need to understand is the capacity uh, to do this administratively and in the, in, the, in the system. So right. having a system in place where folks can access educational opportunities and then record keeping and et cetera, et cetera. Not so stuff. there's a lot that it, it sounds great. It, it sounds like a good opportunity um, and a motivation but the question then is, what do we have in the state, in each of our institutions that allow for this to go forward? That's what I want to hear about. Yeah, and that, that was one thing we grappled with, like if you look on page four, uh, little I, yeah. you know, attend all classes or appointment to complete all casework. The question is, who's going to validate that? Is it the educational system that validates that, or is it DOC that validates that? How, what's that for? I mean, you get into these nuances that that's where we got on us. Teresa? Um, I have a question going back since I noticed in this section, it's, it's the same requirements about notifications and things like that. So I, I see under, uh, you know, in your um, overview memo, it talks about. Uh, a, 90, a timely notice, not less frequently than 90 days to offenders. 
but number one, it just says notifications to victims. Are, are there any time frames associated with the notifications to victims? You want me to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. We worked. Yes. We worked with the victims uh, advocate, victim community, and what came across very clear is some victims would want to be notified every month or once every three months, and other victims would say, "No way do I want to know because it's going to bring up a lot of uh, issues, for me, and I'd rather not know." So we really put in the flexibility there, so the. DOC can work with the victim to see what the victim would really be comfortable with. Right, I, I get that. I get that in that second part about the option to receive notification. Right. But I, I guess it doesn't look like, at least from this overview, that there's any notification to that there's not a time frame of the sort of first notification to the victim um, saying, uh, you know, the this offender is participating in this program and um, uh, you know, do you want to receive any further notifications about that uh, and updates? That, that's what I'm, I'm looking for. Is there an initial time frame? So in other words, the, the way this is reading, and this isn't the statute itself, but the way this is reading is that offender could have completed the program and then now mm -hmm. notification goes out to the victim. And that's, that's not what I Yeah, so I, I kind of, in my, I yeah. combined. So what, what happens is that the end of every month, essentially the record keeping that um, DOC does, they're supposed to record it monthly. And then the way the statute reads is that ensure that victims have access to that information. So theoretically the timing is every month, they're gonna make sure that the records for the offenders are up to date. And then whatever system they put in place should ensure that the victims who want notification have access to those monthly Okay, so I'll, I'll wait for this question. No, I, I think your answer is on page two. On page Teresa. two. This is current law. Yes. That the department would ensure that all victims of record are notified of the earned time program at its outset. Well, right. So that's when it's first, when the person first starts to qualify or starts to receive. Or it's part of the program. So, it, yeah, it's notification of the existence of the program and if someone's able to engage in it yeah um but I, I read that to say alice it, it's referring to it not a it, it it sounds like it's referring to the program not necessarily the person participating in the program the way i read it so the, the way that um and, and again i think doc would probably as far as the match right right well, i'll, I'll ask the question again we'll yeah the but person. but i but the way if you look in um you have the, the statute in front of you, but there's um, in subdivision 4D, it says record any reduction in an offender's term of supervision pursuant to the section on a monthly basis. So that's that monthly time frame, mm -hmm. and ensure that victims who want the information regarding the changes in schedule release have access to such information. So that's the only thing in statute that to me indicates a timeline it is just that DOC needs to record this, this information at least monthly and then make sure that the victims have access to it. What that access looks like, I think is probably dependent on the victim, maybe the system now, given its limitations. But to your point, Representative Wood, there's no firm notification schedule, if you will, right. that, that I see in right. statute. Yeah. But you. maybe policy or rule has dictated otherwise. Thank you. We will be hearing from the victims. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, please advance best we can. Well, it's also, you know, it, one of the reasons I asked the question initially about is there any judicial involvement? Mm -hmm. It's just something that um, folks know about at time of sentencing. Right. So how does that all trigger off? I mean, I suppose that that's another that's another discussion. But it would it's minimal. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah, I guess I better ask a question before my page gets full here. I'm not sure uh, who, who to direct this to. Uh, the first one is, why the seven days? Is that something that was Colorado uh, recommendation? That was recommended by the Council of State Governments. We started out with five, and then they said, you really should do seven, because it just kind of helps with the flow of folks through the system. Okay. Secondly, uh, 
why were pro-release not included in, in the beginning and, and what has changed since and why are we looking at that now? Uh, I mean, you go for it. I mean, my, my understanding is given the parole board's sort of judicial, quasi-judicial role, um, they handle parolees. And so that is another sort of administrative factor that would further complicate it because at that point, someone that's been paroled isn't under the, the custody of DOC at that point. Well, they're under the custody of DOC, well, but they're not under their under parole. They answer to the parole board. Thank you. So the parole board, and we've got someone here from the parole board that will go over this, but what the parole board does when a person is eligible mm -hmm. for parole, the person comes before the parole board mm -hmm. along with DOC and the victims are, are welcome there as well to determine if the person is a good candidate for parole. The parole board, if they feel, yes, the person is, they will put the person on parole, but there'll be conditions. And it's the parole board that sets those conditions. And if the person violates any of those conditions, they have to go back to the parole board to make the determination, does the person go, go back into an incarcerative setting or do they put on different con conditions and the person goes back out community on parole status? So it's under the, it's under the jurisdiction of the parole board of uh, what that parolee has to do to meet the requirements. It's not under DOC. When a person's on furlough, that is basically an extension of the incarcerated walls out to the community. It is DOC that is in control of whether or not that person goes out on furlough and any conditions that are set is set by DOC. If there's any violation of those conditions, it is DOC that determines does a person come back into an incarcerated setting or do they go back out community on furlough with some different conditions? Okay, and lastly, for now, the funding for this, who pays for this? Well, it's all within DOC budget because furlough is under their budget, parole is under their budget. But the schooling itself, I mean. Well, that's part of the issue. Okay. And, and what's happening right now, <clears throat> is CCV is currently going into our correctional yeah. Let's see it. Here we go again. Yeah. Yeah. Must be something with us in this one. Doing this after this evening. Do you have that text that you can send? Must be this happened to us last time. Last time it was it was in the run yeah. They're doing that after we leave today. Yeah, it was about I know. Yeah. So what's up, Agatha? We're checking to see if it's a false alarm. We're not testing the system today. Oh. But there's no indication that there is an emergency. So I'll be back. But I'm like carrying on. I hope you are back. <laughs> um so CCV right now is offering courses within some of the incarcerated facilities and DOC can go into that where the money is coming from for that and the initiative for that. And we did look at that in my committee and say, well, if we can do it for folks who are incarcerated, can we do it for folks who are on parole or maybe furlough? There's a lot of layers to this. I mean, Topper, Topper, do you have a question? I'm told. You have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, what happens to an offender who completes all the coursework uh, required, but doesn't attend all the classes? Well, that's one of the issues. That's why, that's why the committee kind of hunted this to joint justice to figure okay. out what we recommend. Because there's nothing in place right now, Trapper, okay. for this. It's all being thought of. 
Yeah, this is just a, a draft bill from last session to, to give the committee an idea of what it could look like. This is not current law. <clears throat> but under the way it's written, they have to satisfy all three in order to qualify for the reduction in time. Mm -hmm. But as Representative Emmons is talking about, it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. Are people as clear as mud? We're good. It's good. Yeah. Good. Well, what can I do to help clear, clear the mud? <laughs> so I'd like to shift gears. It's 11 o'clock. There. Is there more that you wanted to talk about, Ben? No. Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears quickly. I know that we've got a whole lineup of folks, but I know that there's some folks on a tight time frame, and we do have a resident weights field, Anna Nasset, um, who she's on a tight schedule and has to leave by about 11, 11, 15. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the victim notification systems that I think is, others are going to be following up with later on. So I'm going to be doing a little overview of my thoughts around that. Um, I have resided in Waitsfield, Vermont for eight years after moving here from Washington State. Since 2017, I have worked to educate myself and become involved in victims' rights and services through a myriad of ways. I attended the Vermont Victims Assistance Academy, and after that found myself in a unique position to be able to speak about the crime of stalking, gender-based violence, and trauma-informed practices all over the world. I trained law enforcement, military, college campuses, All right, um, state agencies and communities. I have received multiple awards for my work, partner with the Center for Crime Victim Services, the Vermont Network, and most recently, the DOC. In addition to being an international speaker, I'm a consultant, podcaster, activist, subject matter expert, and the author of the book, Now I Speak. In the last year, I've been asked to speak in Washington, DC for National Crime Victims Rights Week, as well as go to the White House twice this year to speak against stalking and also to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act. I serve on the board of Avali and Violence Against Women International, the VineLink Advisory Council, which is our victim notification system, and I'm the vice president of the Mad River Valley Chamber of Commerce. But before that, I'm a victim of, and survivor of stalking for the last 15 years. And the issue of earned time expansion and victim notification is incredibly important to me. In order to speak clearly about this issue I have with this act, I would like to first share a brief overview of my story in order for the committee to fully understand the impact of this piece of legislation. So in 2008 or 2009, though I became aware of it in 2011, a man named Fraser Rochford has been stalking me. The offender is a stranger to me, has a mental health diagnosis, and is a serial stalker. At the time, I was living in Port Townsend, Washington, where I owned an art gallery and was truly living my best life. The offender targeted me because he wanted to show artwork at my gallery. And though I did not know, he also believed that we were married and sometimes wants to murder me. I also did not know that he had been watching me for several years prior. He began to torment my life through messaging, following and impacting my every movement with fear of threats. In 2012, he served 364 days in jail for misdemeanor harassment. By the end of 2013, I had closed my beloved business due to the relentless behavior. And in 2016, I relocated to Vermont to try and find safety. This did not happen. And in 2019, I refer returned to Washington State to testify at the trial of Mr. Rochford. He was found guilty of aggravated felony stalking and felony cyber stalking. He was sentenced to the maximum of 10 years in prison. At the time, one of the longest sentences in our country's history for stalking. The crime of stalking is a terrifying sexual and psychological crime and effects of it will carry with me for the rest of my life. I'm a survivor of many forms of gender-based violence starting from the age of three years old, but I'm a victim of stalking despite the sentence because being a victim of a crime is a lifelong sentence while being an offender of a crime is not. Because the offender is incarcerated in Washington State, I have relied on the Washington State Victim Notification System to keep me informed. This system is VineLink. The same system Vermont uses, but with very different results. I signed up for VineLink in 2012 after my very first police officer told me about it. I called up the number and spoke with an actual person 
who was trained in trauma informed practices and learned how this notification works. That if he was released on bail, I'd be notified immediately. And over the years when this happened, I was notified immediately. I learned that if he was released from custody for serving his sentence, I'd be notified. And once again, I was. On more than one occasion, when the DOC reporting center had an outage in Washington state, I received an alert from VineLink letting me know that in case if I was a victim awaiting release of the offender. In fact, one time I was in the middle of Canada when I received such a notification. There was a point in 2017 when law enforcement in Washington state didn't know where the offender was and were incredibly fearful for my safety of myself and other victims. Another victim and I took matters into our own hands and quickly discovered through a search on VineLink that he was incarcerated in another county in Washington state. Throughout my journey as a victim of crime in Washington state, VineLink has been shared with me by almost every agency that has had hands on my case, from police officers to DOC. It begs the question, why isn't the same tool working effectively here, and this must be addressed? And you'll hear more of that from other people testifying today. With this act, you're assuming that victim notifications are set up for every possible scenario major imaginable, <laughs> that everybody, every victim will get regular updates and an ever-changing release date for the offender. This is not the case. In passing this legislation, you are leaving victims in a very harmful situation and causing additional trauma. What VineLink can do and how Vermont is utilizing it are two very different things. As I said, I do happen to sit on the VineLink Advisory mm -hmm. Council as the only outward-facing victim survivor and have sat in many meetings learning the capabilities mm -hmm. of what this service can do if used properly by state agencies and if victims are educated on this tool. I serve on this council to make recommendations that only a victim and survivor can make with an unbiased opinion. I know the options for additional language translations that will be asked for today are in place. Ad hoc notifications are slated for the end of the year. And because of the voices of the Center for Crime Victim Services Advisory Council, of which I'm also a member, menu options for victims when signing up are also being looked at to implement. I understand that VineLink is a vital tool and it can do things like allow us to know a funder release, allow us to know about um, protection orders being served, so many different things. But the admin piece of what you're doing currently is outside of their scope as far as having this earned and learned time. We need to be looking at how you all are gonna be creating a system for this. Now, VineLink has already implemented that everybody who gets a notification has a notice in there about possibility of earned time and early release. But as you're gonna hear from Kelsey Rice in a little bit, this tool does no good if it is not being used by state agencies. And to re reduce victimization of the people using it, victims must be educated many times of this tool and how its notifications will come through. Even though I've had great success as a VineLink user for 12 years, my heart still stops when I get a notification of change in location of the offender who is currently incarcerated. How many different agencies who have cared for me over the years identify the tool of VineLink allows me to move through those moments of panic and access the information I need. Vermont needs to build a communication strategy for victims to understand these systems as they are ever changing and continuously focusing on offenders' rights. When we turn to earn time and looking at any sort of victim notification, I will say this. Washington State only offers probation and parole for severely violent crimes. All other crimes have a minimum time served release date that moves around based on appropriate behavior and then also earn time. The current targeted release date for Mr. Rochford sits around May 2026, which means that on my calendar is in place a call to the Washington State DOC Victim Service Line every three months to find out when that new date will be. Because yes, on that actual date, I will receive a notification from VineLink, but I need to start preparing for that now, as do countless other victims. <clears throat> Earn time puts an additional work and fear on victims. And if we had learned time in Washington state, he'd probably be out because he is a terrifyingly intellectual human. And I will even quote one of my officers who worked my case over the years. He said, he's so highly intelligent that it's not a matter of if he's gonna kill, it's a matter of when. And his intelligence is a factor in him committing these crimes. So when we look at learn time, 
we are putting other people in harm's way while doing good for other offenders as well. I do want to acknowledge that. But how many millions of victims do not understand these moving release dates, what these laws you are doing are, that are getting random notifications that a law just changed their earned release date? None of us should be victims of crime. But when I compare services from <laughs> reporting all the way to sentencing and after, I am so grateful that the crime that was done against me happened in Washington State and not in Vermont. I hear from victims and survivors in the state regularly, and I can say with almost certainty, I would probably not be alive if the crime had happened here. Being a victim of crime is a job I did not interview. Suddenly one day in 2011, it became a full-time job. And now it's a part-time job that I'm always on call for, received no training for and little support. And I don't ever get to quit this job. None of us do. We look around and see the lack of communication and support, the fading of funds for needed programs in our state and the push for offenders rights over our own. I you ask today that you please pause moving forward with this act. Understand how it will affect further traumatize and cause fear of potential harm for victims. Look at the capabilities of Vinelink and, Vinelink and look at the systems that need to be put in place and used across the board for all victims of crime. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. And thank you. I do have one question. And, Absolutely. And, and some clarifying statements. When um, you were signed up in Washington for the victim notification, it, was it done voluntarily in terms of how many times you'd be notified and the length of time, or was it just automatic? There is an automatic kind of re response that you get from them. Um, and this does speak to, to that product. Years ago, they had it where you had a menu of options that you could choose. But because victims are in such a place of trauma when we're signing up for this, and sometimes victims don't even know they've signed up for it because everything is chaos around them, nobody was signing up for those options. So when they rolled out their next version of VineLink several years ago, they didn't include that. Now what we're doing or they're doing um, through like the voice of Center for Crime Victim Services Advisory Council and myself is re-looking at that to add those options again. And that's in Washington or that's here in Vermont? VineLink is a company right. based in Louisville. So this would be across the country. Yeah, to every state who uses it. So our role right now on this issue is to make a recommendation <clears throat> in terms of uh, do we expand the earn time to uh, folks who are on parole? Uh, do we also look at providing earn time for folks if they are engaged in an educational program or trades program or whatever? It would only be a recommendation to <clears throat> the full legislature come January. Um, part of that recommendation could also include the victim's notification system and a recommendation in terms of how that needs to be updated, how that needs to be really looked at, maybe reconfigured here in Vermont, that could be a recommendation from us. But we're not the committee that's going to en enact any right. changes. So I just wanted to be clear on that, that that's what our role is right now. Teresa. Well, thank you, Juan, for sharing your story um, and for being here today. So um, what I heard you distinctly say is in um, Washington, several different, several different entities, you know, from law enforcement to corrections to, you know, uh, sort of all along the victim services, all along the way, you heard about the system. And um, like you said, you, people need to be told it multiple times and explained and, under, and have it understood. And so, and I'm inferring from you saying that you're glad that you, you know, had this happen to you in Washington, not Vermont, that um, is it your experience that law enforcement here, crime victim services, um, corrections, that there isn't that same kind of support for victims in terms of sort of like ongoing education about this notification system? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that would, that's something like we had a big meeting with the DOC with a lot of different people and agencies in the room and, you know, kind of unraveling that. It's like, you know, from talking to a friend of mine who's in state police, he's like, I've never heard of this tool. Mm -hmm. I was never educated on this. So if we're starting back there, and so I, I know that like 
you're making recommendations, but like my recommendation would certainly be like to move forward with this earned and learned time without looking at this piece <clears throat> is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. And that I believe that finally with tooling and time and implementation in our state can be a really good fit, but it also takes all the state agencies to understand what it is and to educate victims continuously over time. So that when they get that notification, as jarring as it is at 6 a.m., like the last time I got one, I can move through that and gain that information. It's always gonna be scary to get that. Mm -hmm. But through education, through giving us respect of understanding what the tools we are and signing up for <clears throat> those things is a huge piece of it. And I, I just really fear that moving forward with earn time and learn time so quickly and without looking at how this is actually going to affect this very, you know, <clears throat> underserved population. Thank you. Absolutely. Other questions, thoughts? Thank you for your Thank testimony. you. Um, it's very helpful. <clears throat> As I said, we're just <clears throat> looking at what our recommendations will be to the General Assembly come January, and it will be up to those respective committees if they decide to work on it or not. Yeah. Um, I'm going to shift away from the victims. Um, I mean, if, for the time being, I'd like to bring up um, the parole board, Mary <clears throat> Jane Ainsworth. She's the director of our parole board, just so folks can understand what parole is and how someone um, does get on parole, what the process is for the parole board. So, Mary Jane, welcome. Good morning, Mary Jean Ainsworth. I'm the director of the full board. Um, so, Madam Chair, you'd like me to go through a little bit of the whole parole, just a synopsis of parole. Yeah, you know? just explain what parole is. Because okay. I think people get really confused probation, parole, parole, parole. So, parole is another mechanism for community release um, from an incarcerated sanction. Um, all sentenced offenders with a minimum and a maximum are eligible for parole um, at, for, to be released on parole at their minimum release date. Um, there are a couple mechanisms for that to happen. Um, one is through presumptive parole, um, which they are presumed eligible to, for parole unless there are six disqualifying, disqualifying factors that would rule them out from presumptive parole. Um, and then there's the initial eligibility hearing. So at their, their at least 30 days prior to their minimum, they would um, be scheduled for a parole hearing and they would come before the board to be interviewed. Uh, they can waive that hearing if they choose and not want to be placed on parole. That does happen frequently. Um, once they, if the board grants parole, they are then released on parole status and they are supervised by the Department of Corrections um, with conditions that are set by the parole board. If they, if they violate one of those conditions, they would then be brought back before the board for a violation hearing um, to determine if they violated the condition, and if so, if their parole would be revoked or if they would be continued on parole. Mary Jane, how many folks are on the parole board and how <laughs> do they become members of the parole board? So currently we have seven parole board members, five are members and two are alternates. However, we treat all of our members the same way. Um, they are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. Um, the way our chairman does our scheduling is he tries to equally schedule um, the seven members equally. We have about nine to 10 hearings every month and with three board member panels, and he tries to divvy up everybody equally. They serve on three to four hearings per month. And do you have uh, a number of how many folks are on parole right now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I actually pulled it just a few minutes ago from DOC's website. Um, as of August 31st, um, there was 638 individuals on parole and there was 184 individuals on community supervision for a low. So there's a drastic, there's a drastic difference. If you looked back prior to justice reinvestment two, this number would have been significantly in reverse. Um, there has really been an initiative 
by um, the legislature, along with the Department of Corrections and the parole board to look at parole supervision as being the same as furlough supervision in the way that DOC supervises these individuals, because previously parole was looked at as more of a step down status. That once you are on parole, people would go out most of the time on furlough. Once they were set up in the community, then they would become come before the board um, for a recommendation and then they'd be placed on parole and the supervision was lower. They wouldn't be supervised to the same level as a furloughee. But now everybody is supervised by risk and that I think has changed. That's why we're seeing these numbers um, changed. And what are you seeing? I mean, you've been on the board for a number of years. What are you seeing for folks who are on parole in terms of their violations of conditions and coming back before the board? Is it pretty stable? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? I think with the number of individuals that were now paroling out of the incarcerated, out of the correctional facilities, which the board wasn't doing prior, I didn't bring those numbers with me. Um, we have seen a slight uptick in um, violations. However, we're also seeing an uptick of parolees, especially where the board is now granting more out of the correctional facilities. And I think most of the, it takes individuals time to get themselves established in the community. And those first 60 to 90 days are really crucial in their transition up to six months. And that is where um, we see that sometimes. One thing that we were hearing in the past, and I don't know if kind of your numbers kind of indicate differently, but one thing we were hearing in the past is it wasn't the incentive for folks. The person who was incarcerated didn't feel the incentive to go out on parole, even though there was more leeway on parole because they, they could go across state lines, possibly they weren't um, as heavily supervised as they would be on furlough. But there wasn't the incentive because they didn't have earned time in parole that they weren't asking for parole. They were asking more for furlough because they were getting earned time off their sentence. But the numbers that you've indicated, the 600 on parole versus 100 some on <clears throat> furlough seems to be counterintuitive, counterindicative of that. So we do see individuals who choose not to come before the board either at their initial eligibility hearing through a waiver or through an annual review um, because everybody is reviewed. If you are not granted parole, you're, um, the individual is reviewed annually um, to see if this person should be looked at for parole or not. Um, we have seen 47 individuals, I shouldn't, seen is not the right word, there has been 47 individuals thus far this year from January to September who have chose not to come before the board um, because they want to earn those seven days a month. Um, so we are seeing, this is an uptick from last year. Last year, we had about 16 individuals who didn't want to come see the board. So it is a little bit more of an uptick because when they do waive their hearing, they have to put a reason for why they're waiving. And during the annual review, it will come up in the parole summary that is submitted to the board of why. So those 47 yep. it would automatically mean that those 47 would be at least on parole. Maybe half of them would. I mean, that's hard to tell, but they're taking up a physical bed in a facility at the cost of 70 to 90,000 a year. Some of them could be, and some of them are out on furlough, are out on furlough. community supervision furlough um, that just chose to, would like to remain on furlough due to the earned time. Um, I'm curious because, because you know, one of the things that the chair explained is because of the difference in supervision and who's who's responsible, um, DOC versus um, the parole board, that that's sort of one of the complicating factors about the um, earned or learned uh, time off. And uh, has has your board discussed whether you have the capacity to undertake um, the you know, process that we're looking at making a recommendation. So I think this is where this is where I think it gets complicated. And we've looked at our partners over at DOC as well, because DOC is the the department that does the sentence calculations. We don't do the sentence calculations. Um, even when a parolee absconds from supervision and then they come back, 
we have to, for that time that they were gone, I contact the DOC sentence calculation unit, they add that time onto their sentence. So it's really that partnership between us and DOC. So I think I would, the board does not have the capacity to be adding the earned time onto without additional staff onto a parolee sentence. However, and I'm not sure about DOC, I'm sure they'll speak to it as well. I'm looking at Isaac as I'm speaking and he's <laughs> nodding. Um, I have done some sentence calculations in the past, so I understand the, 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 all the complications around that as well. Um, so I would, we would look to DOC as the official record of that minimum and maximum release date and the sentence calculation to be um, the one to administer that. They are also the ones doing the supervision. Um, we are not doing the supervision. So um, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're yeah. what you're saying sure. here, because some of this is um, not what I deal with on a Absolutely. ongoing basis. So um, so it, it it sounds like it it doesn't necessarily have to mean something different from the perspective of who's supervising, who's doing the calculation, <laughs> uh, their status of whether being on parole or furlough. Because essentially that can be that could be done. I'm not saying it would be done, but could be done through the Department of Corrections um, in collaboration with with the board. Right. Because we do that now with our supervision. With we supervision. collaborate with the department. The department, the probation parole officers for the department are the ones supervising the police. Thank you. Tom? Yes, thank you for being here. Quick question. Is there a, a, a matrix or a prerequisite or, or a bar that's set? For both parolees, parolees before such as housing, gainfully employed, uh, what what are those things they look at before? So the parole board instituted last year um, the, a structured decision making framework that the board uses to help inform their decisions. Um, it takes into factors of community super private previous community supervision pre. Um, in, their disciplinary behavior while in the facilities, their release plan, um, criminal history, programming, all of those factors. We um, were accepted into our program through the National Institute of Correction. We are the 11th state to implement this framework, um, which helps the board. It doesn't tell the board whether or not to grant parole. It just helps them inform their decision of and really look at certain factors as they're going through a case and how to interview the individuals to make sure that they feel they feel that they're at a point with their release plan, they have their treatment set up, what their treatment needs are, um, that kind of thing. It's, I don't know if I hit some of almost. Almost. I was thinking I didn't quite get it. It's nice to have a release plan, but it's just something that says, okay, they have to be gainfully employed, they have to have housing. Um, I mean, with the lack of housing and homelessness and whatever else, just putting people in. What's what's the prerequisite, I guess, for, for the plan that the really for really so I, I'm not sure if we exactly have a prerequisite around housing and employment. Um, I think the big things that the board is really looking for is, is what are their housing options? Do they need to have an approvable house um, option out of from the Department of Corrections? Could they be released um, to um, a family member? What are their options? They, that comes out in some of the interviews. Also, the big thing is really looking at is the individual set up with their treatment? Um, do they, because a lot, I'd say a 90, at least 90% of the individuals have some kind of substance use disorder. And making sure that they are set up with the treatment what they need and really what are the needs that they need and can they get out um, to make sure those are met, some of the basic necessities, and then the employment and everything will come. Thank you. So we have two levels here. One is, do we make a recommendation that we extend earn time to those folks who are on parole? And it would be modeled some, the same as what's currently in existence for folks on furlough and those incarcerated. That's one layer. The second layer is, do we really do we look at providing earn time to folks who are on parole, maybe folks on furlough? If they're involved in an educational program or a work opportunity or an apprenticeship or they're working towards an electrician license or a plumbing license, 
<laughs> How would that play out in your world? From an equity standpoint, um, I, we would definitely advocate for parolees to be included in earn time, just so there's not a, we would either advocate for parolees to be included or for Louise not to receive it. Because so it feels like there's an inequity um, of those getting released on community supervision. Um, that was, that I think that that's what I testified in committee about is really looking at that the piece of if you're on community, so if you're a sentenced individual on community supervision, either parole or furlough, either be the same or not receive it. So then there's there's not that kind of competition between the two, two statuses. Um, I do have the concerns about the victim. I, I, we do have the concerns about the victims. The board is very involves victims in their parole hearings. They um, encourage victim feedback and testimony if they feel um, that they would like to um, do so. Um, and we would want to make sure that that everybody is included in those notifications as well, because it is important. Um, thank you for that segue, because that was my question. <laughs> um, so um, does the parole board, um, I guess, specifically talk to victims about the notification system and their ability to obtain notifications? So we do not talk to them about notifications. Um, we do not notify victims of the parole hearings, DOC does. Um, and so we, the only, the, the conversations that the board has with the victims is at the hearings um, and getting their input on release or not release. And if they are released, what kind of conditions would be helpful for them to put some safeguards in for the victims? So, I mean, this is theoretical because yep. um, parolees don't have access to this yet, right. at least. Um, but would you envision, would you envision uh, the board having a role in, uh, let's just say, if, if you know, a lot of steps between, you know, right now and wh whether or not this is implemented, um, but would you envision the parole board um, having a role in uh, assisting victims in understanding that notification process? I don't know if we'd have a specific role in that. I would look to partnering with DOC to see how that would all work together mm -hmm. um, because I don't want to also do overlapping notifications and so forth. But the other thing to understand is the individuals that are coming to the board for parole are already earning earn time. So they've been earning inter earning time regardless if it's incarcerated or on furlough. Okay. So they've already been receiving those seven days a month. Okay. So it would just be a continuation of receiving those seven days instead of it stopping. So I guess I wasn't talking about yeah, you, know, I mean, you signing people up for yeah, the no. system, but I was, uh, you know, what we just heard the previous witness say is like every time she encountered um, any part of the system, they were they were telling her about this notification system and you know making sure she knew about the options and being educated about it and that seems like an appropriate role for anybody in that process who is encountering um or, or has a decision making authority over what the um, um the the person uh, leaving or person in the correctional system um so um i, I guess I'm, i i tend to think that Anybody involved in that yeah, process that should be at least informing the individual and you know making sure that they have the resources or know how to get the resources because anytime somebody learns something new or learns about something mm -hmm. new, especially if you're in a trauma situation, you're going to need it multiple times. Absolutely. Multiple times. Okay, thanks. And also just to kind of piggyback on that a little <clears throat> bit, a lot of the times when a victim is kind of, when the board is communicating with victims, um, uh, generally, a DOC victim service specialist is with that individual or has been talking with that individual. Thanks. So I'm going to move this along quickly because we have a few other folks around some time frame. But what would be if we decided to make a recommendation that there would be some form of a work or an educational component? How how would you see that play out in your world? I think it would really, I think the biggest question is who makes it really looking at what that learned, learn time, I'll call it learn time, 
um, would look like and who's making the determination if the individual is participating in that learn time. And I think the hardest thing for the board is that we're not seeing those individuals and that once they're on parole, we don't see the individual unless they are um, coming back for a violation or a reprimand or potential early discharge. <clears throat> Um, so I think it'd be a question of do you see in their capacity for the probation and parole officers of tracking that learn time. And I think that's where it's going to get complicated. Would the board put as a condition of parole that they participate in a work or, or educational program or not? I think we could potentially look at it, but I think that also raises some questions too of what are those programs yeah. who's are there sponsors for those programs are we are we setting someone up potentially for failure if they don't have the resources or the capacity to participate in those programs so i think that's the next the next thing too is what are if folks are integrating into the community if we're looking at some if these programs aren't sponsored necessarily do a lot of these individuals have the capacity or the funding for these programs. Or are they even available in their area? Right, that's another, ge geography is a huge thing because we see that all the time with treatment. Anything else? Anything else you want to share with us, Mary Jane? I don't think so. I think that was the... Thanks. Anything else from the committee? Thank you. Yes, no problem. Um, I'm gonna jump around. We get up the we have a victim, a person, a survivor from sex, Kelsey Rice. And Kelsey is on Zoom, and <clears throat> Kelsey has a time commitment um, <clears throat> of needing to join, has until about 12 o'clock. So I'm squeezing you in because I know you took some time off your job today in order to testify. So, Kelsey, welcome. And if you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, thank you very much. Kelsey Rice, Vermont resident, uh, Saxon Theater, Vermont. And I do apologize. I wish I could be there in person. I could not make it up today. Thank you for squeezing me in here at this time. Uh, I am a lifelong resident of Wyndham County, a survivor of intimate partner violence, and a member of Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services Victim Advisory Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in consideration of the proposed earned time expansion and victim notification review. I would like to thank Jennifer Coleman, Executive Director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, for her commitment to lifting up survivor voices and her steadfast victim rights advocacy. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the late Senator Sears for his many years of service and for supporting victim voices being heard in consideration of the proposed earned time expansion. As a victim of crime, I have experienced stalking, physical, sexual, emotional, and economic abuse. When I was ready to seek freedom for myself and my three children, I needed to rely upon all of Vermont's systems of support and protection. That included accessing support for trained advocates and Vermont's criminal justice system. In every interaction I have had as a survivor, I have analyzed these services I have received. I do not have time today to share the many examples of positive experiences I have had with individuals providing system services. Every individual who has touched my life while providing services to me has left a lasting imprint on my recovery journey. I have also had many horrible experiences navigating just about every system there is designed to support victims of crime here in Vermont. I do not presume to know how to do anyone else's job with that said, I am extremely confident in saying to you all today, we need more trauma-informed training across the board when it comes to system-based responses to victims of crime. Prior to fleeing intimate partner violence, I had no experience engaging with the criminal justice system. From the very first domestic assault report I made to law enforcement in 2018, throughout my journey as a survivor, navigating that criminal justice system, and to this day, I have been appalled by the additional harm Vermont's criminal justice system causes survivors. My decision five years ago to begin publicly sharing my story was fueled by my outrage 
for our more vulnerable community members fleeing violence in this state. I offer my story in service to Vermonters who were not gifted with the level of privilege I possess. Today, I will be sharing my experience with Vermont's victim notification system, VineLink. August 2018, my abuser was charged with domestic assault and interference to access emergency services. At that time, I had no knowledge of how the criminal justice system worked and no understanding of how little time perpetrators of domestic assault can be held. Vermont State Police did not inform me when they released him after he was charged in August 2018. I was notified by my abuser showing up at my house standing outside my window. April 2019, my abuser was charged with breaking and entering along with numerous conditions of release violations, which were in place as a result of his August 2018 charges. The incident in April 2019 involved my abuser breaking into my home in the middle of the night. I heard a noise in my dining room just outside my bedroom. I got up to check on my two older children who were sleeping in their bedroom and found my abuser standing in the dark, blocking my path to my children. He proceeded to threaten to kill himself and me while holding a knife to his arm. I did not fight back when he raped me with my baby in the bed. For five hours, I did whatever I could to keep him quiet in order to prevent my older children from waking up. He left on foot at sunrise. I called 911. Vermont State Police Dispatcher informed me because my abuser left the premises, a trooper would come take my report but it was not designated as an emergency. I emphasized to the dispatcher I did not know where he was and that his stalking behavior was escalating. A trooper arrived to my home to take a report over an hour later and then called me later in the day to inform me he had located and arrested my abuser. The trooper informed me of my abuser's charges and said he would be held at Southern State Correctional Facility. This was the very first time he was held following a report I made to law enforcement. I thought surely I would receive information regarding what to expect next, certainly before he would be released. The April 2019 incident took place on a Friday night into Saturday morning. My abuser was arrested, held at Southern State that same day, a Saturday. My abuser was outside my bedroom window the next night, Sunday. I was in shock. No one told me he was released, and there he was outside my window again. I knew I could not keep him out. Vermont State Police took over an hour to arrive when I called 911 the day before. He was becoming increasingly loud, and my primary goal was to not wake my children with the hope of protecting them from further trauma. Again, he raped me with my baby in the bed. Again, I did whatever I could to keep him contained. Again, he threatened to kill me and himself. Two days later, Tuesday morning, I dropped my children off at school and went to work, holding it all together as survivors do. While in my office, I received an automated Vine Link call informing me my abuser was going to be released from Southern State Correctional Facility. Thankfully, I made it to the bathroom before vomiting. Receiving that automated call two days after he was back in my home raping me was more than I could keep shoved under my professional facade. The massive breakdown in the VineLink notification system was due to a human being not entering in time-sensitive information when my abuser was processed and held at Southern State on a Saturday. No one contacted me to explain what VineLink is or that I was set up to receive notifications. My first introduction to VineLink was the automated call on that Tuesday morning, two days after my abuser was released. I cannot express in words to you all today what that call did to me. The level of courage and resilience it took to survive the violence and then carry on for my children in order to provide them, provide for them through the crisis is something only survivors of intimate partner violence can understand. Receiving that automated call two days late illuminated for me 
just how alone I was in my fight for our freedom. I received that violent call during a year-long series of law enforcement and probation and parole errors, which led to additional harm and increased safety risk to myself and my children. A few months after that violent call came, two days late, it took law enforcement and probation and parole six weeks to issue a warrant and arrest my abuser for violations to his condition of release and violations to my release from abuse order. It was only because of Wyndham County State's Attorney Victims Advocates, Katie Selmap, that anything was done, despite the many violations to my relief from abuse order. While I waited in terror, not knowing whether law enforcement or probation parole informed my abuser I had reported him, my abuser continued to stalk me, threaten my safety and the safety of those around me. A relief from abuse order is simply pieces of paper if the system response is designed to uphold RFA orders do not function as designed. January 2020, my abuser was sentenced to serve nine weekends in Southern State Correctional Facility for violating my relief from abuse order and his conditions of release. His weekends were to be served beginning in March 2020. He was excused from reporting for his sentenced weekends as the pandemic was on the rise. September 2020, my abuser was sentenced to a year in jail as a result of more violations to my relief from abuse order. While my abuser was incarcerated, I received automated calls from VineLink informing me of his whereabouts and when he was being transported places up until he was released. Every time I saw the VineLink call coming through, it was a trauma reminder. Whether I wanted and needed those updates or not, any information coming through about my abuser and leading up to information of when he would be released is another additional trauma reminder. When I was not available to take the call, it would come through repeatedly, creating additional anxiety for me. It is, it is possible I received both written and verbal guidance on how to navigate now Vine Link when he was inc incarcerated. I imagine if I did, it may have been shared with me during intense periods of elevated trauma. Therefore, I simply could not absorb the information when it was delivered. You have already heard testimony today of how important it is to give us this information repeatedly. Vermont needs to closely examine and address potentially life-threatening gaps present within the criminal justice system here in Vermont, including victim notification. Vermont needs to invest in additional staff training and oversight to ensure victim protections are upheld. Vermont's victim notification system is operated correctly and provided to victims through trauma-informed practices to enhance accessibility to all victims and survivors. As a victim of intimate partner violence, I have a life sentence. I will be safety planning until the day I die. Generational trauma caused by intimate partner violence will carry on down to my grandchildren, regardless of my tireless efforts to mitigate the lasting impact on my children. When I think about the issue of earned time and Vermont's heightened focus on offender rights, it is very clear to me those in positions of leadership do not recognize the devastation to victims' lives does not end when the criminal justice system is no longer involved. This state continues to level fund victim support programs, assuming the system-based responses to crime we have in place do not need a massive overhaul. My abuser benefited from earned time in 2021, leading to his early release. I was not my abuser's first victim nor was I his last. We cannot push forward with initiatives like earned time expansion until Vermont takes a closer look at where the current system is broken. I ask you to please pause moving forward with Act 159, prioritize improved systems to protect victims before moving forward. Thank you very much for your time. I am willing to send my written testimony to the committee if you're interested, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Kelsey, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I, I, I think one thing that's coming through really clear, <clears throat> at least on my end, I don't know about the others here, but 
I think we really do need to start taking a look at our victim notification system and how it's working, not just in DOC, but elsewhere within our criminal justice system. And we may make some recommendations on that. I don't know. But I think also what's really important in your testimony in looking at the people who are sitting around the table here in Montpelier are members of respective House and Senate committees that look at issues that touched every part of your testimony in one way or another, be it funding, be it the criminal justice system, be it the human um, pain that occurs, and be it DOC. So I think your testimony has been very, very helpful and very fruitful. And I can't say where we're going to go with it at this point, but it will really uh, help us in our deliberations for that. Um, questions from committee members? <laughs> Comments? Okay. Uh, Kelsey, I just, again, want to thank you. Um, and I would think at some point when the legislative session begins again in January, committees are up and work up and operating. There may be some committees that may reach out to you for uh, testimony again. You know, we'll have to see. I just don't know. Yeah, but just I mean, uh, I've been working with Jennifer Pohl, and we are looking at some various other victim issues in the context of the of the judiciary and the state's attorneys and the like. So, and we will continue to work. Well, there are bigger issues than even what we've been hearing today, right. frankly. So this just helps. Yeah, no, and your work as well. No, it definitely does. And I appreciate. It. Thank you very much, Kelsey, for your testimony. Anything else from the committee members for Kelsey? Thank you so much. Um, I um, also want to thank you for taking time out of your work schedule for today. And I hope you can go back to your work schedule today and um, be strong and not feel re victimized again. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's move on. I know I'm jumping around. I'm looking at time. We're really crunch up. And we did start about 15 minutes late. And here is another one. Uh, so Tim, Tim isn't in the room. And he was on Zoom, right? He was here. I can, uh, so I'm from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I can, I can, uh, yes. Okay, that's where I was going next. Awesome. So, uh, Christopher, right? Yes. Okay, why don't you come on up? I know that Tim was in the building earlier. Tim had to leave because he has fixed six Good. Yes. If you give me two seconds sure. just to uh, get um, the, for the record, I'm Christopher Lukasik. I'm with the Vermont Department for State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I work in Brattleboro as a victim's advocate with the Office of the Wyndham County State's Attorney. And I have a pretty old computer that uh, needs a moment to let me sign in. Um, I submitted a report to the committee, yes. I have a partnered uh, presentation that gives the broad stroke uh, details of that. Again, if my computer would load. <laughs> Well, is it something that you're trying to post on our screen or access? Yeah, post on the screen. You have what I printed for you. Yeah, this is the only thing we I, have. Is that what you're looking to post? I, I'm not. Po I wasn't going to post that. I have a. I have slides that basically bring all the broad stroke um, findings of that report. There's nothing new that I'm trying to present based off that report. If I can't, then that's fine. I'm just wondering if you could. Did you send me those slides? Yeah, send no. me. I don't have the slide. Um, I get a, if I join the Zoom, which my computer's letting me in now, I should be able to. I apologize.
There we go. There we go. Now you're going to have to mute yourself <laughs> or something. Awesome. Thank you. All righty. YouTube will hear them, right? Yes. Yeah. I have a loud voice too, so I think it will pick up. Um, so, whatever, we'll just do it this way. So, Act 159 is our earn time. Yes. Block. Yes. So, um, I am reporting based off of feedback of the state's attorney victim advocates across the 14 offices. Um, after uh, the, the, the committee asked the department to uh, provide testimony on this, uh, victim advocates uh, were given a survey. Um, about 15 victim advocates responded to that survey, which we have 27 victim advocates across the state. Um, so that's about a 55% re uh, response rate. And then we had a full bigger discussion about these uh, questions. Uh, basically, our questions answer the questions that have been talked about throughout the day. Um, should earn time be expanded to include parolees? Um, overall, we said no. 14 people saying no. No person said yes. One person declined to answer. I'm not going to be discussing who declined to answer and why. We, we're just going to be looking at yes and no's. Um, should earn time be expanded to allow for learned time, um, as we've been calling it today. Uh, generally, we've said no. About 80% of respondents said no. This gets into um, VANS. In, in the past, it was called VANS, the Vermont Automated Notification System or Service through the uh, Department of Corrections. We now call it VINE, but when we did this survey, it was called VANS, or we knew it as VANS. Um, Victim advocates were asked, do you have confidence in the operation and effectiveness of the VINE system or VINE? Um, two people said yes, 12 people said no. Um, and do you think that uh, VINE has the ability to effectively handle the expansion of earn time? Uh, very boldly, we said no, 14 people saying no. Um, when asked to provide some qualitative feedback on these questions, um, about six people provided um, written uh, feedback. Every, the highlights are in the report, but I want to highlight these four people. Um, one person said expanding earn time would uh, send a message to victims that their experience does not matter. Uh, one person said the constant never-ending frustration of the system and uh, the ability for re-victimization and all of the unknowns um, would be uh, damaging to victims of crime. One person said um, that there is that based on how earn time was uh, originally rolled out in 2021, I believe, um, which I believe I included the exact uh, notice in the report, um, that victims uh, had uh, that confidence in the criminal legal system with victims was further uh, eroded um, after that rollout. Um, and one person talked about how um, that victims do not have any noted benefits to any of these laws that uh, are being discussed today. So what are our recommendations? Um, victim advocates prefer finality in cases. That was a recurring topic that came up that we need to be able to say, this is the, the general um, minimum and this is the general maximum um, when we are uh, informing victims at time of sentencing. Um, we would not recommend extending earn time to parolees or um, not expand to educational credits or learn time. Interestingly, one person um, talked about their concerns of equity that especially on the uh, educational credits topic, uh, that would only really benefit the people that had the means and the abilities to do that. Uh, for example, one thing we talked about was um, imagine someone who has very limited or no ability to read and write. Say that person then get, <clears throat> learns those skills, learns how to read and write. That's not one of those trades or degrees or whatnot, but it is a significant um, advancement for that person. Would they get credit for gaining that skill to learn to read and write? Um, 
We've talked about customizable uh, Vine notifications to vi uh, fit victims' uh, wants with what they uh, want to receive, whether it's one general monthly um, notice or they never want to get notice. Um, as of right now, there's a very simple um, uh, what's choices in how victims can uh, receive information. Um, and we are interested in trying to make it as customizable as possible. I can tell you that um, the state's attorney victim advocates have been talking to the Department of Corrections Victim Services Unit. We are very excited to be working with them on this, and they are similarly very excited to be working on this. So I want everybody to really hear, uh, not take what I'm saying as this is going to be our opinions forever, because there's a lot of work that we're going to be putting in over the next few months. We just picked off this work actually last Friday, this past Friday. So four or five days ago. Um, so we, uh, it could be that, you know, six months from now, we're here, we're going to be here again, saying something different. Um, sentence calculations need to be provided by the Vermont Department of Corrections um, at, as soon as humanly possible after sentencing. I know in past testimony um, that there was some discussion about the state's attorney victim advocate providing that information. We don't have the tools to say, oh, it's September 1st and you're sentenced to five to, ten, five to 10 years. This is like, let's punch it into a calculator. We just don't have those tools. So it could be that if we had those tools or we had a better line with sentence calculation, we could be providing that information. But right now we just don't have those tools. Um, there is growing concern among the victim advocates that uh, post conviction, uh, post -conviction non-court victim services are being placed on the state's attorney victim advocate. I want everybody here to understand that the state's attorney victim advocate works the case while it's pending in court. From the moment that uh, that case is sent to the state's attorney's office to the moment that person is sentenced, and we also work the, the appeals, we work the post-conviction relief, but anything outside of that, whether it's arrest from time of arrest to or investigation to the case being sent to the state's attorney's office or any time after sentencing um, and uh, any probation violation, anything like that, um, earn time, all of that, it, it just cannot fall on the state's attorney victim advocate. Our job description doesn't include that. Our pay grade doesn't re reflect that. It's really important that people understand that the state's attorney victim advocate duties need to be contained to court activity. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, in the report writing about language. It's really important that the language used is not jargony, that we're not saying, we're not specifically referencing hearings or we're using um, uh, acronyms or anything like that. Um, the current notices as they're written make a lot of assumptions. And again, this is an area where um, the state's attorney victim advocates and the uh, Department of Corrections Victim Services Unit are looking to collaborate on. We will literally get into the weeds of looking at a notice and saying, what does this sentence say? If I'm someone who has never had an interaction with the criminal legal system before, will I understand that? So that is a lot, uh, uh, a lot of the exciting work that uh, state's attorney victim advocates and Department of Corrections Victim Services Unit uh, will be doing. Um, and this hits on uh, the, the bullet point I just uh, mentioned in my last slide, but there, it, it's very clear that we need full system education on um, the role of the state attorney victim advocate, that we're not that go-to victim services person for all victim needs. Of course, naturally, someone's going to call the state's attorney's office and say, hey, I need help. Where do I go? Easy, very quick conversation. But... Um, system actors always, uh, whether it's judiciary, DCF, DOC, et cetera, et cetera, um, pointing to the state attorney's office and saying, call, you, call the victim's advocate, that's just an inappropriate use of the victim advocate and is not reflective of our both pay grade and job description. Um, Should it be? That's a great question. Um, that's not something we dis di uh, discussed. I, I think that when people are thinking of victim services, they think of the state's attorney's office first. Um, but as of right now, we just don't have the capacity to do anything beyond the court advocacy. I hate to say that. Yeah, right? yeah. I also think about um, 
that you know what we've heard from victims mm -hmm. both today and previously that sort of adding layers to the system or so like um actually when i think of victim services i think of the center for crime victim services right. first yeah. um, yeah. and so um it's just a, a question out there. It's like if if there are additional resources needed, you know, where would recommendations be made to put them? I guess is. And I think that that is tied to a lot of what we've been discussing as victim advocates. There's certain duties that has always historically fallen on us, and we've reached this point um, of just saying, you know, we just don't have the capacity right now. So I really like the question of resources, resource allocation. Um, I can tell you that the state's attorney victim advocates, we need more staff. Um, we, I, I think 27 is very, very low for, um, someone that, that translates into, uh, an average victim advocate carrying about 600 cases. And that's not 600 victims. That one of my cases alone has 30 counts of burglary. 30 individual homes were entered that we filed under one charge. So that one case, I have at least 30 people that I'm working with. Um, so obviously not every case um, needs constant attention, constant uh, communication. But when I, I always caution people, when you hear 600, it's not 600 people. It's, it's, it's usually far more than that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I would love to t talk about, I, I know you have limited time, but I would love to talk about with individual committees on what the state's attorney victim advocate program does need. It's, it's, uh, I, I see us at a, at a, at a point where either we are going to grow or we're going to have staff start to start to leave because they just, it's, it's, it's a really difficult job. Um, and without the proper support, we just, it's, it's unfortunately unattainable to, Stay. Um, I do have. We have another question. Yeah, Jen, I mean, it's more of a statement coming from what uh, Teresa said as well. So, so we're going to be in in the House Judiciary revisiting and really looking at victim the victim advocates and how we're providing victim services because yeah. there's actually an, also a, a fundamental issue on really whether the state's attorney's victim advocates are really victim advocates as opposed to liaison. And let me explain. I know there's great services that, that victim advocates provide, but there is no confidentiality between the victims and the victim advocates. Anything the victim says to the victim advocates has to be passed to the state's attorney, has to be passed to the defense. That's different in the model of the network against right. the violence, which is separate. So, so we need to dig into that a little bit because so they're providing really important services, but there are limits on what can even be provided given uh, certain Supreme Court precedent as far as what has to be turned over. I just wanted to flag that since since we're talking about this. Yeah, and I would love to continue the conversation about that. Yeah. Um, and that again can be a recommendation from this committee in terms of really looking at the victim services at the county level state's attorney's office we can make some of those recommendations okay, that's good. That's, so i, I need to move you along i know i have a couple more comments just from the department um i know there was a question about how does this get considered in sentencing when prosecutors are making offers and all that i can confidently say and i have worked many many cases where we do consider uh the possibility of earned time we we generally calculate it to be about a 25 percent haircut um, from a sentence. So how do we look at those numbers considering a 25% reduction, possible 25% reduction? So it is happening, and I, I believe it will continue to happen if we expand it to parole and with learn credits. Um, the department also wants to very briefly and uh, very briefly acknowledge um, Kelsey and Anna th that everything I'm talking about uh, does not compare to the um, testimony that both of them provided. I hope the committee really values what they what they said. Um, besides that, um, I would say the department definitely agrees with the lack of education and knowledge across the system regarding um, buying. I think investing in that that education, making sure that all our system actors know about this service and provide and uh, relay it to victims will be really um, impactful. Um, and I think one question that we are considering is, um, or, or wondering about is how will the education credits, if the recommendation is to implement it, 
How would that um, affect people who already have those degrees? Um, for example, and I don't mean to throw my weight around, but it's very, very new to me. I have a doctorate. Um, I, I have a master's degree and I have two bachelor's degrees and doing the quick math, I would have five and a half years worth of credit if it was retroactively applied to me if I um, then committed a crime and was sentenced for it. If the committee was to say, if you already have these degrees, it also cre it credits to you too. So I, I think there's some ongoing questions on how that really works. I obviously think like in practice, that's not how it would work. Yeah, that's, uh, and I'm seeing people here, but there are um, those types of questions on how this would be implemented. And um, with that more information, again, I could be back in six months at individual committees and saying, well, our opinions have shifted because of that new information. So I, I, we, we look forward to seeing how this um, plays out and how we can all continue to collaborate. Thank you. And as I said, this committee, it's just a very high level look, just right. a recommendation. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Driving up. Of course. Um, I'm looking at the time. It's 12 o'clock. We're going to work until about quarter after. And we did get started at 10, 15 minutes later. I'm looking at DOC. And Josh, you're here. Um, what is, and Dale came in, I'm presuming, Dale, did you come in for the uh, funding award for the yeah. CCPC? <laughs> so how does COC want to work this? Do you want to continue the conversation of uh, earn time, or do you want to shift to the grants? I think perhaps we could give very brief testimony on earn time, learn time, and then shift directly again to the CCPC funding grants. That's possible. Please. It'll be very brief. Wait, Josh, why don't you come on? He said very brief and then he sent me up. I don't think. So we got a very good question. For the record, uh, Dr. Rutherford, facility operations manager with the Department of Corrections. Um, one clarification I wanted to make on the disqualifying offenses on earned time is that those were a one time thing. Those were if you were serving that on January 1st of 2021. Um, and that was related. My understanding is that that was the legislature's intention was that after that, victims would, in theory, be aware of um, that possibility. So if you are sentenced on a crime today, there are no disqualifying offenses mm -hmm. at all. Okay. That was that one time. And that, that was that one because those were the victims who were, were most upset. Is, I thought this was 30 years, not 23. So it was only for those folks at that time that were earning earned time. Um, that yeah, who were serving the Senate for one forward. of those disqualifying offenses on January 1st, 2021. You said they could keep the time that they'd already earned in that couple of months. Uh, I think that's going forward. But going, they would not. But also going forward, anybody sentenced for anything is eligible as long as they meet those other criteria. So I think that's important for the committee to understand. Even people who have a life sentence? It's the, it's the crime, there's no disqualifying crimes. <laughs> you can't take a uh, life sentence as exclusionary. Is it, okay. But well, the crime, if, if you have say a 30 year sentence, right. it would come off of that. It would. Yes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, one of the key differences, or one of the things that we noted with the Colorado bill very specifically, uh, was that it was designed around nonviolent felonies. And we've done the math sort of at an incarcerated population. We just don't have very many people serving um, lengthy periods of incarceration on nonviolent felonies. Um, so, and I believe the, the sample language or the language in the proposed bill didn't have that exception. Um, so if you're looking at folks who are incarcerated, we're talking exclusively or almost exclusively about folks who are serving time for violent felonies because that should be have incarcerated long enough to take advantage of such a program and then earn that sort of reduction. Um, so I think it's important for the committee to understand that if you're looking at further reduction of that to, for folks who are incarcerated, we would be looking at, at violent felon convictions for the most part. Uh, that should be impacted. That would not necessarily be the case for individuals on parole. More confusion? No, I'm not confused. I'm not happy, but I'm not confused. <laughs> um, in terms of an expansion to parole, um, uh, 
Mayor Jane gave some numbers uh, this morning about 648 folks on parole. Uh, if you were to expand the parole uh, program to match the furlough population, um, that would make some logical sense for some reasons that have been discussed. Um, you asked, uh, Senator, uh, about the cost. So when this was initially implemented, the uh, department um, took on earned time without any additional staffing. Um, and so we just sort of followed that as part of our budget. That was a significant increase in workload for the Senate's computation unit, um, which I oversaw at the time. Um, we have looked at that. I don't believe that we could also pick up parole um, without uh, additional resources. Um, we did pick up that initial earned time lift. Uh, and I think Mary Jane actually worked in Senate Trump for a while. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, and we did pick up that initial lift for the folks who were incarcerated. Um, fortunately, not fortunately, but fortunately for the unit, the courts were operating on a much lower function at that point in time. Um, so we we're able to incorporate that. Um, but to add an additional 650 people plus or minus uh, to those roles would stretch that that group beyond they're able to do right now. So there'd be definitely a cost implication. There, there, there would be, and, and it really is just a matter of volume. Um, we sort of stretched that as, as far as we could uh, in terms of the volume when, when it was first implemented, but I, I don't think we have room to do it further. <laughs> um, and the, the learn time program, as as has been discussed in various iterations, is substantially more complicated. Um, expansion of, of just earn time to parole is relatively simple. Um, we already have a process set up that would be an increase in volume, not a change in kind. Uh, the learn time thing would definitely have a higher administrative burden to it. Um, and, and that would pose some challenges. I did hear um, very loudly the victim testimony today. Um, and I've got a couple of takeaways for that, which are some of which I think are internal to our department. But one um, that I think is really, really important is the earlier that communication can occur with victims, the better. And when I've had conversations with victims uh, who are upset, um, it is usually because there was a difference between what they understood was going to happen to the person and what did. Um, they thought they were going to be in jail for this amount of time, and instead it was this. Um, and that communication cannot start with DOC because that decision has already been made for DOC. Um, victims need to know at the time of sentencing um, what that implication is. DOC can and should communicate with folks as that goes on, how that actually plays out. Um, but their first introduction to that absolutely cannot be when DOC says, oh, that, that five years actually means potentially three and a half. Um, and that applies both to that, but also to uh, not as often, but occasionally to um, our work camp program. Um, we've had some folks where, uh, even though certain um, offenses, we've had some folks who were, were victimized um, and we're very surprised that the yeah, individual was eligible for work camp credit. Um, and that's- work, And work camp credit is one day for every day served. That's a significant reduction. It's a right. All right. So I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, so the issue with vines it is, is the Vine system, is it the Vine system itself or is it the implementation in Vermont? I mean, I am not our Vine expert. Um, so I understand sort of intellectually how the system works. I've had no, very little interaction with it. Um, I do know that part of that problem is it has to be, it has to be provided to the victim very early. Um, so I heard Kelsey's testimony about um, her thing, DOC would have had no contact with that victim at that point in time. Um, we would, wouldn't even necessarily have known who she was. Um, so that contact with her, that that implementation for violence has to happen at that law enforcement level. Uh, and that is not my area of expertise. So let me ask a second question. Who, who's in charge? I mean, who is it? This a DOC? Is it state's attorneys? Is it law enforcement? Who actually runs violence? You would see the DOT is the old, yeah. Contracts with, okay. Yeah. It's out of your budget. Yeah. Yes. And we do have people who can speak to that intelligently. I'm just not. Right, okay. Okay. So I'm just wondering, you know, who we reach out because I think we're going to need to dig into this a little bit further. Maybe you. 
That's why I was trying to figure out if it's me or you. So. You or me or both. Or both. We're good at working together. Yeah, we'll probably we'll figure it out. So that's sort of what I had. I think other than that, you guys may have had some questions, and I'm happy to sort of go wherever you have questions. I think we're starting to wind down. Yeah, yes. that's fine. And I. But we're gonna have we're gonna have more committee discussion on this. We we're hoping today. I don't know if we can schedule schedule it in, but that's not in our November meeting because we are going to have to make a meeting. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yep. And to the extent that you identify any questions <clears throat> in advance, or we can try and prepare information responsive to those, um, and make sure we have the right folks here too. Great. Thank you. So if the committee can bear with us. Real quick, and Derek, I know this is a challenge for you. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got 15 minutes while I get o'clock. What DOC reached out to have see if it's a tweet oh, oh, This oh, is talking oh, about brand oh, awards back down for our CJCs. Um, they're going to be uh, distributing these grants shortly. They wanted to give us a heads up because there was a bill that went through Martin's committee. Blame us on judiciary committees. Um, we'll take the credit. Yeah, in terms of kind of restructuring the the funding streams for our CJCs, there's been monies, a lot of money that has in the past come through DOC. Then there's been some money that has gone through our AG's office and um, the two judiciary committees spent a lot of time this past session trying to clarify these funding streams and what is being done with our justice centers. And I think this is just gonna be a continuum yes. conversation this next session mm -hmm. and the session after that and the session after that. But DOC wanted to give us a quick Heads up, because we will probably be receiving a lot of questions from our local CJCs, thinking maybe their funding had drastically changed, but maybe not, because some of their funding now will be coming from the Attorney General's budget instead of DOC. Correct. But that's, <clears throat> that's, that's the plan. plan. <laughs> that is the plan. They will get carried out. <clears throat> Sure, but all right. Thank you. Technical difficulties have been resolved. Uh, I'm Gail Crook. I'm the director of innovation uh, for the Department of Correction, and with me is Derek McDevnick, uh, community and court justice executive. A lot more letters. And, um, so we appreciate the time. I know. We're really tight now, and I'll I'll try to speak quickly. So if you don't understand, it's because I'm speaking really quickly. Uh, luck. Oh, I know what that feeling's like, and I hate this position. So, um, so we are in the process of going to be sending out some RFPs um, for our community justice services that the department uh, procures, um, and and kind of the thought process behind it, uh, we use something called a uh, project logic model to help determine how. Um, how we can scope uh, the proposals for RFPs coming out. And all a program logic model is, is really a, a geographical uh, display and understanding of how program desired outcomes and impact will be achieved based on the resources available and the activities undertaken to, uh, for the program. And this program we're talking about is the scope of work for um, our community uh, restorative justice communities. <clears throat> Uh, it's also important to understand and distinguish between the specific service capacities of the DOC supports through these discretionary grants 
and the partners uh, organizations that do the work under the moniker of the Community Justice Centers or the CJCs. Uh, DOC funding is intended primarily for the direct provision of community and restorative justice services outlined in our grants. Now, what the project logic model is, is basically we take inputs and it, and it kind of, those inputs drive our activities, which provide outputs um, and outcomes, and then it kinda, they kind of see each other to, to what the impact's gonna be. Um, so one of the primary inputs is, is Act 180, the changes, um, and that primary change is that the DOC is no longer responsible for pre-arraignment restorative panels. Um, and our scope of work for the grant. So that's a big change right there. Um, we have some legislative language. Um, we've also updated our inputs. We updated our mission, vision, and values. Uh, last year and this year, we rolled out a new strategic plan, uh, which have restorative justice uh, as kind of part of the pillars and those scopes of work. Um, activities, the main activity is we're gonna be sending out um, a request for proposals. Um, <clears throat> Coming out soon, we look to get them out October 25th. Uh, we'll be issuing them out. Um, they'll be due in January 31st. So we're allowing a lot of time for uh, for our you know people <clears throat> interested in bidding to, to kind of put the proposals together. Uh, together. And the grants go into effect July 1st. Um, one of the big things we did is we looked at our funding model, how we have done before. Um, it's been patched over the past two decades we've been doing it. It's just been patched and patched. Um, so we kind of looked at it and we did a, um, using the logic model, we came up with a, 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 an equitable and just way of how do we look at funding um, our, our services that we're procuring statewide. So each provider that we have with our grants will have a $100,000 base. Um, so every, every um, grant team will have a $100,000 base. Um, those that are co-located with a correctional facility in their catchment area will have an additional $75,000. Um, and then the remaining portion of, of our budget will be divided proportionally by the PMP offices based on their headcount size. So Burlington will have a bigger uh, pie than Morrisville, for example, based on the services. Um, so going faster than I can keep up there. Okay. Um, so uh, so the, the, the services are going to be delivered through a regional structure and partnerships. Um, and those partnerships will be with the DOC facilities, the probation process, and the courts to provide the services. And the services that we're looking to procure are facility-based restorative justice development. That's something new that we're going to be uh, with these grants adding to our facilities. Um, uh, Reentry navigation, which we currently do now, that will be in all the grants. Um, the facility-based one is only going to be in, in the catchment areas with um, providers that have a facility in their uh, catchment area. Um, circles of support and accountability, um, and then post-education rep reparative panels uh, with or without probation. So that's the scope of work that these grants will be providing uh, for the state. Um, so outcomes. Well, one of the first outcomes is the department will be compliant with state statute, which is always a good thing. Um, it will allow for an equitable uh, allocation of resource. Uh, the department will be transparent and consistency within the DOC community and restorative grant making pra uh, practices. Um, and then intentional service design uh, within the bounds and resources of the DOC authority. Um, and our impact, and this is kind of kind of what we, you know, what we hope to, to provide is the state community and restorative justice services effectively supports the DOC vision, creates safe and equity by seeing potential, supporting change, and serving communities. Um, I will rip through the data really quick. This is everyone's fun time. Um, so this first figure is FY24, so last year's fiscal year, um, uh, restorative panel, both pre-charge and post adjudication. Now, understanding that the future one, the pre-charge will not be part of it. So you see all the gray lines, the DOC is, is no longer responsible for that scope of work. This is our um, re-entry services that our, our grants provide. This was last year's as well, FY24. Um, and this just shows the number of COSAs and uh, re-entry navigation through the sites. So I'm gonna ask a stupid question. What is the 2840? 0-2040, is that number of individuals? Is that dollars? What's, what? Where is it, 0-2040? Yeah. 
Why? What's on your monitor? Oh, uh, fiscal uh, 24, fiscal year 24. Right. Why? Oh. Yes, the answer is yes. That represents number of unique individuals oh. served okay. through unique the re entry yeah. and navigation service. Provided, uh, arranged by our district offices. So right. we've shifted our organizational model and funding to look at what is the demand look like relative to <laughs> key office that's not broken down by individual community justice center anymore nor is that really the construct through which we're organizing our investments we're anchoring it to the organizational architecture of our probation and parole offices can i ask a yep. question related mm -hmm. so so and i i assume there will be subcontracting to the CJCs, you know, for instance, Chittenden County, there are four. And I mean, you have one place that the funds are going to, but what happens with the other more localized CJCs? That's a great question. The standard state RFP language contemplates the opportunity to propose a subcontractual um, way yeah. of delivering the services, and the state has the ability to evaluate that structure and reserves the right to accept or deny the ability for a primary grantee to subcontract for those services. Good. And I don't have any knowledge of what to expect in terms of that proposal uh, from any given county. Um, the, RFP, the RFP language will specify a, a required description of how the services will still engage local community members throughout that service region, as well as to the greatest extent possible, provide those services locally within right. those communities. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, figure three here is FY24, 25, and 26 funding. Um, the, the dark purple is last year's funding. The, Pink is this year's, and the gold is the proposal, the FY26 funding. Um, you can see it, some of them have changed, some have gone up, some have gone down. Uh, the big reason for the change is we're no longer um, funding the uh, the pre pre trial restorative panels, um, and also an influx in uh, facility based uh, restorative justice practices. So there's a couple of counties, there's a couple of places that we're going to hear from. I'm assuming um, when this goes out, and BA is Barry, Barry, and BU is Burlington. Yeah. They're going to see a big cut, not realizing that some of, that that may be made up through the AGs. We've yeah. already been hearing. Already. Also, understand that there are multiple providers in those counties right now, and it will be going to just one provider in each of those counties uh, for for DOC. That for our for our grant funds. So your grant funds can range anywhere from two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, almost up to a million. Right? Is that what that's saying? Yeah. No, our grants don't go up to. I mean, I'm just looking on the Burlington out of the four. Uh, Providers in Chittenden yeah, County. Right. That's what the. 100,000, they look like, depending where you. Oh, that's, that's zero. a million. We're in this figure. A million. Yeah, right. And we can give you. Oh, so, yeah. In, in Chittenden <laughs> County, currently, if you total the grants that we have among the four different uh, providers, it sits just below uh, a, million, a million dollars in Chittenden County. So, what did we get from DOC? Yeah. Part of that one million that they get now um, is going to come from DOC, which it does now. But your share is going to go down a little. Other folks' share in the funding stream proposably will go up, so that it equals out that million that they received previously. That's in theory. Yeah, and, and it's hopefully more than a theory. I mean, because because just I want to just point out uh, if you look back at that figure one, uh, that's there's 450 of thereabouts cases that were pre-charged 
those are cases that could be ending up uh, in the courts instead. And, and that's a significant impact on what we're uh, dealing with with the courts and processing times and backlog. So, I mean, we have to keep that in mind. And this has been a critical issue for us is the court backlog and taking pressure off the courts. So there's a lot of reasons why that uh, pre-charge needs to be funded. But you're right. I mean, it's not funded yet. Uh, I anticipate this attorney general's office will have a request for the appropriate funding and that it will go to the administration and hopefully it'll pass on to the administration. If it doesn't, there will be many advocates here in, in the, the state house to make sure that that we're not uh, shoving 400 additional cases over to the courts instead of into a food charge. So. And uh, our last uh, figure here, it kind of breaks down by kind of percentages. It takes um, the post education from uh, fiscal year 24 um, and the fiscal year 24 PEP population. And those are, and if you add those numbers across, they'll each equal 100. So it accounts for everyone. And then the red, it comes out to what the funding proposal will be for FY26. And that little pink thing on six of them is that's the, the facility. Addition. That's why that that pinks there. The seventy-five thousand difference. Now, if you play that record a little slower than what I spoke, you might be able to to, to hear it. Uh, any questions? I know you guys want to eat lunch, but we're happy. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to to contact contact us, and we'll be more than happy to provide you any additional information. And I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming in and just giving us a quick heads up on this because some counties it's really. You know, Initiative. For some, for some uh, entities, it will be it's a it's a big change, right? But I th I think also look at the positive uh, the positives of what they're proposing to particularly bringing more restorative more processes restorative. into the systems. Right. I more think that partners. that's a great yeah. uh, move forward. But we can't lose the transition. For the yeah, the transition may be really messy, but once you make the transition, maybe the funding streams are going to be clear right. in terms of <clears throat> who's responsible for what. And that's part of why we're adopting a singular regional provider with a slight asterisk, which you may have noticed in our Hartford Probation and Parole District, the, the geography in that that district also serves Orange County, and there's an existing agency. Not to, It's an open bidding process, but that's the only probation and parole district that will have two different DOC-funded RJ providers directly connected to it, but proportionally budgeted based on that. So that will be a change in counties where DOC currently funds more than one entity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a lunch. We'll be back at 1 o'clock.